It's winning time. Welcome back, everyone, as we are breaking down Season 2, talking Episode 3, which was titled Second Coming. As we see the early and tragic start of Larry Bird's career, Magic becomes a Laker for life, and Paul and Pat don't have much trust left in one another. We'll be discussing that and much more in today's spoiler breakdown. But first, let me know what you all thought about this episode. How did you feel that they captured the tension between the coaches? How did they handle Larry Bird's story? And we get to see more of that Irving and Bus Magic. Let me know what you thought of the episode in the comments below. With that being said, we got an episode to break down. Full spoilers ahead. The 1981 NBA season ends with the Boston Celtics being crowned their 14th championship in their franchise history. As Bus and Magic watch what they believe was their championship being held by their enemies as Red and Bird blow smoke in the Lakers' faces. Now, splitting this up to the four main plots that we have in this episode, starting off with what's going on with the Buzz family, we see Jenny prepares for her family game night and find out that she was running late and she's already been replaced by not only her brothers, including their girlfriends, but their father has honey over as well. As Jeannie is playing third wheel in his family game night, she's trying to get the attention of her father by discussing business, but Dr. Buss doesn't want to talk business during this game night, which I found to be odd considering what he said during the last game night in last week's episode. Now, being ignored isn't new for Jeannie, neither is her father prioritizing his relationship with women over her, but I feel as though she figured that now that she has this franchise, maybe he would be more considerate to hearing her out more and paying more attention to her passions, but also notice how much she wants to impress him and acknowledge her successes. But we see that clearly isn't the case so far, as Buzz seems to be keeping his promise with being serious in this relationship with Honey, as he surprises her with his private room being filled with romance. We see Honey whispers to him as they're dancing not to hurt her. Now we cut to seeing Johnny being pissed at his sister for trading his girlfriend, and he brings up that she'll never be his favorite son. Now, as I mentioned in last week's breakdown, the kids' subplot in this relationship with Dr. Buss and Honey, it just isn't working for me at all. Right now, it seems to be setting up that Jeannie's either going to be leaving her family business behind if her successes keep getting undervalued, or she's just going to keep pushing forward and becoming more like her father regarding business comes first and personal relationships come last. Speaking of relationships, Honey and Dr. Buss most likely won't work out and it probably won't last much longer, especially when this new NBA season kicks off, because Buss wanting to find her seemed to be so odd to me, and right now it seems to be playing that it was more of a distraction from keeping him from missing his mother, but also a distraction from keeping his thoughts away from the Lakers losing, especially in that first round in the NBA playoffs. Now, I believe once they get the new season starting off and they start winning, he's going to probably have either a new woman walking into his life, or he's going to really try to focus on winning another championship, which in return would mean that his relationship with Honey would no longer be the case. Make sure to share your thoughts in the comments on how you feel about the Bus family with the kids and his relationship in the comments below. Now, switching gears and talking about the tension between the coaches, Paul and Pat Riley, we head into the offices where Bus wants to know what happened with the team last season led by Coach Westhead. As Westhead believes he needs more authority, not having others influencing the team decisions, which is the complete opposite of what Jerry West believes, which is he needs less authority in his position. But what does assistant coach Pat Riley think? And in particular, does he believe that Paul still has the respect of his players? And we see, as Pat has been doing for most of not only this season, but last season, Pat responds saying that Paul does have the trust of his players in that locker room, which we know as an audience, that isn't the case. But yet again, I want to point out, this is yet another example of how this is a complicated relationship between Paul and Pat, which is a prominent theme in this particular episode of showing how these relationships are extremely complex. But we see Dr. Buss ask the players what went wrong last season, starting off with Norm, who, as we expected, he blames Magic. He says that it was his fault that the last play was how they lost the series to the Rockets, for his example, showing that Magic's ego caused them to lose the game. Now, just a quick side note, I personally am not one of those people that believe that a single player can cost a team to lose an entire game because there's 
many more minutes in the game. There's other quarters that couldn't play it out differently. But yes, I do believe that a player can make a bad play or make a bad cause that can cause a play to go wrong in that possession. But again, I don't think a single player should be responsible for losing a game for a NBA team, football team, soccer team, you name it. But that's just me. Let me know your thoughts on all that. But we see Magic Extension is being brought up to Dr. Buzz, which catches him off guard considering that he already committed to Magic Johnson with his five-year deal which any smart athlete would do this because yes, they want all the accomplishments, they want the high stats, they want the championships to prove their worth. At the end of the day, their legacy has to be important to them, but more importantly is having that financial guarantee for not only their future, but their family. In reality, how pissed was Dr. Buss about losing in the playoffs? Well, in his memoir, Coach Westhead says that Buss was extremely upset, not just because they lost to the Rockets in the first round, but then you couple that with the Boston Celtics winning their championship in the 1980s. Now, licking his wounds, Dr. Buss was determined to not waste another season. He met with his basketball trust heads to find out how they could win again. As Westhead says, they have to win big next year or else. Coach Westhead continues to say in his memoir that he described going on a vacation one summer and he got a late night call from Dr. Buss and Dr. Buss was adamant that the team needed to not only win in the coming season, but they have to do it in an exciting way. But also, win another championship mean that they got to take away the crown from the Boston Celtics. Now back with Coach Westhead, he wants to make a move that he believes will help the team. That move would be acquiring Mitch Kupchak, who had four previous great productive seasons with Washington, and he was a part of the NBA championship in 1978. What we see at this meeting where Paul shares his news, we see that Jerry West disapproves of this decision, especially after failing to bring in Thompson. But more importantly in this scene, we see the carryover from last week's confrontation between Coach Riley and Coach Westhead continues as Paul didn't even remember to invite Pat to this very important meeting. Now, I don't think he forgot. I think that was very intentional on Paul Westhead's point. As we see, Paul also shares that he brought in his friend Mike, who's not only going to be scouting players, which by the way is Jerry West's job, but also Paul reveals that he's going to hire Mike as his second assistant coach and he just leaves the room without any questions being asked. I'm sorry, but Paul, in my opinion, was just doing way too much right now. But I do want to point out how Jason Siegel is playing this role really well, in my opinion. While we see him making these what he believes is good decisions, he feels bad doing this. You can see that he doesn't really feel comfortable having this type of power in his hands. And it's all in the facial expressions, but as well as it just doesn't come natural to him. So I just love the way Jason Siegel is playing this role. Again, you can see he does not feel comfortable not only making these decisions, but he also doesn't feel comfortable of his relationship with Pat Riley at this moment. As Pat confronts Paul, who says that he wants someone loyal, who he can trust, and he tells Pat that they're good, but as an audience, we know that their loyalty is on rocky ice, especially after that plane ride before they lost to the Houston Rockets in Game 3. As Westhead gets the green light to go ahead and make that move for Mitch Kupchak, it comes at a loss as they have to trade their front court player, Jim, who's extremely pissed about the decision, not just because he likes playing for the Lakers, but also he mentions that this is going to affect his family because they recently just bought a new house. Now, I completely understand where Jim's coming from and his perspective of the situation, but unfortunately, this is a perfect example of showing that ugly side of sports, which is at the end of the day, it is a business. But again, Paul made the decision without Pat's approval. As Paul wants Pat to get in line and there will be no more side talks, there will be no more side practices and no more crossing boundaries as the assistant coach again. Pat pushes back and reminds Paul who stood by him throughout his mistakes and he respected him even though he didn't deserve it as Pat Riley walks out of the room. And these performances are so good between Jason and Adrian. They're so beloved. Believable, and it's kind of tragic to see this, right? Because if you go back to last season, we saw just how close they became, especially after Jack McKinney's injury. And to win the championship and see them having their trust with each other to now compare.
parents and how upsetting it is to see them losing the trust, losing that brotherhood. And again, the performances just gives it all away. Again, the performances between these two coaches are phenomenal. Now to get into what actually happened at the trade of Jim. Now, Jim was very popular with the Lakers and he was very instrumental of them winning that championship in their 1980 run. But when Westhead became convinced that free agent power forward Mitch Kupchak was the answer to their prayers, he was happy to throw Jim into this deal and make it happen. Now, Jerry West thought that this deal was ridiculous because Mitch was asking for $800,000 a year, and Dr. Buss was kind of on the fence about this deal until Coach West had convinced him that Mitch was their missing piece to helping them win another championship. Now, did Westhead really edge out Riley with a new assistant coach? Well, Riley's perspective on the situation was a bit unknown, but Westhead did bring in a second assistant coach during that season. This new assistant coach did help scout pro and college players. With this new assistant, Westhead believed that he could have the needed intel to navigate Wes's effort to control the roster. Now, the friction between Coach Westhead and Coach Riley, while it was kind of dramatized for the show, this was drawn by various accounts that the bond between those two men kind of was kind of breaking up and their close brotherhood was kind of shattering apart. And we saw the turn kind of take place in the season, as many players were called during that time. O'Reilly never badmouthed Westhead publicly. Behind closed doors, he expressed doubts of Westhead's leadership, as well as confusion over the wisdom of the office of system they had that he felt as though it didn't really play into the Lakers' strengths. Meanwhile, Coach Westhead began to believe that Pat Riley was becoming too big for his role as an assistant. As Magic Johnson describes that the mounting tension between the two men in his memoir, the two men stopped eating meals together. Due to their mounting stress, Pat Riley began chain smoking. Now let's shine a spotlight on Larry Legend, who starting off in 1974, French Lick, Indiana, with a population of less than 2,100 people, the home of Larry Legend. As he pays a visit to his father, who couldn't be happier for his college boy, but unfortunately, Larry has recently dropped out of school because he wasn't feel like he was meant to be there. He didn't feel right. He was honestly just homesick, but his dad reminds him of what staying home looks like, but Larry, he ain't going back. A cut to February 3rd, 1975, Larry Bird learns that his father, Joe Bird, who at the time was 48, unfortunately takes his own life. Fast forward to 1976, we're introduced to Bill Hodges, Indiana University assistant coach is scouting Bird, who reminds him how rare of an opportunity he has, and he's wasting this opportunity as he convinces Bird to come back for at least one practice. And during this practice, we see why he goes by the name of Larry Legend as Bird comes into this practice with jeans. Yes, that's right regular outside normal people wearing jeans and he shows exactly why he is a legend as he is just busting ass in his practice which we end up cutting to 1979 we see that red plays a visit to bird who hasn't committed to the celtics and it's been over a year now and he just wants to win one more college game and particularly win that championship game because he lost to Magic Johnson. We wrap up Larry Bird's plot in this episode in 1981, where we see he's back home after winning that championship, and he goes into his father's barnyard, and he looks at all the newspapers his father had kept over the years with all of Larry Bird's accomplishments, and he ends up coming across one of those newspaper readings which showed Magic Johnson beating him in college, which is just fuel to that fire, fuel to one of the greatest rivalries in sports history. Now, shining a light and breaking down the reality of Larry Bird, did he really drop out of college? Well, yes, that was a very true story. He did drop out of the state of Indiana. Just didn't feel comfortable. His first year was very rocky. Larry was recruited out of high school by legendary coach Bobby Knight to Indiana University, but shortly into his freshman season, the Hoosiers bird ended up dropping out. Now, focusing on the legend born of tragedy, Larry describes his father, Joe Bird, as his best friend, a man who loved his son. He was encouraging to him to be strong and independent, but Joe was a tragic figure in his own right. It was documented that Joe Bird definitely had some issues financially. After Joe and Larry's mother divorced, it was said that he fell into a really bad depression. On one occasion, Larry Bird recalls that his father told him and his other kids that he wasn't planning on staying around much longer. 
Now to answer the question, did Larry Bird really dominate his college team in jeans? Well, they don't call him Larry Legend for nothing. As is recalled by the Indianapolis Monthly, this is how it went down. After Bird left IU, Bill Hodges, the assistant coach at Indiana State, continuously tried to recruit him to come to play for his school. When Larry finally came up, he did pull up in blue jeans. As Hodges did offer him some shorts and sneakers, Larry Bird declined and he ended up just busting everyone's ass on that court. Wrapping things up and closing out with Magic Johnson, who after losing to the Houston Rockets, Magic is at a camp where he is having his toughest critics, which are kids, reminding him that Larry would have made the play to win the game, and these kids ain't taking it easy on him as we end up finding out that this is just Magic Johnson in his own head. He's suffering with some self-doubt that he has going on, but also he's got his extension on his mind after bust surprise players like Cooper with giving him 10 times his pay from his last contract. Contract. I don't know if I missed this, but we see that Magic Johnson and Cookie are on speaking terms. Now, the reason I say I don't know if I missed this is because last time we saw them talk, it almost seemed as though they weren't going to be talking for a while. So I don't know if we missed the scene or if it's just assuming that they've always are going to be in communication, even if they have a falling out of a sorts, as we'll talk about here in a second. But we see that she brings up the level of commitment that he has for the Lakers, and she doesn't feel like it's being reciprocated to him. As I mentioned last week, I feel as though we've been missing these scenes with Dr. Buss and Magic Johnson, and we finally get that in this episode. As like I mentioned earlier, Dr. Buss is committed to making sure that his Lakers can continue to win and beat the Celtics in particularly, but he also wants to be committed to a star player in Magic Johnson. As Magic and Buss finally share a scene together for the first time really this season, Magic talks about their contract. They have an honest moment between each other as Buss wants his commitment to be a leader in the locker room, but he also wants him to be a Laker for life. And we see Dr. Buss offers him $25 million to be a committed Laker for his life. Now, obviously, Magic is over the moon as he calls Cookie about this deal and the terms of the deal, and we see them having a little bit of back and forth, having a disagreement here as Magic tells her, if you're not committed to the Lakers, I don't need you in their life. So right now, we see that they're not on speaking terms, at least for the time being. If you guys know Magic and Cookie's relationship, she will be back in the picture sooner rather than later, as we have one of my favorite scenes of this episode being displayed, as we see Bus invites norm over to his house and oh yeah magic johnson is there as well as bus wants to get back on the winning terms but he poses the question and he's pressing norm about what happened last season but in particularly why did you say that to the media he wants norm to let everything out of his chest now we see norm is being pressed and he tells dr buzz while magic is in the room kind of walking around him back and forth he says he loves playing for la he loves playing for the lakers and everything between him and magic is all good and listen man I love this scene because this was a straight up shakedown. This was a mafia move. This felt like I was watching Goodfellas. I love this scene, but low key, if this was me, if I was normal, I would have been asking for a trade or to be released because that is just uncalled for. Now, again, this is a business, but I feel like they just handled that so unprofessionally if you ask me but what's going on in this episode and particularly speaking on the contract 25 years for 25 million dollars this was actually true this was an offer that was given to magic in 1981 bus offered magic johnson that lifetime contract of that 25 for 25 and at the time this was the longest and most lucrative deal in history of sports Now, since no player had ever played longer than 25 years in their professional level, this deal clearly extended well beyond Magic's playing days as they highlighted in this episode, thus guaranteeing him a future job with the Lakers in some capacity. While this deal seemed very lucrative for Magic, a lot of people did point out that he was only getting paid $1 million per year, which obviously at Magic's caliber, he was very underpaid. But at the end of the day, Magic understood this contract because it was a display of loyalty, and that's really all he really wanted was that loyalty, not just being a key Laker player, being a franchise player, but he wanted that commitment from the owner, which was Dr. Buss. So even though it was a little bit cheap, he loved having that lifetime guarantee with the Los Angeles Lakers. 
But again, it is a business, so indeed within a few years, Magic realized he was being underpaid and renegotiated the financial terms with Dr. Buzz. And as he described in his 1983 memoir, in the summer of 1981, he offered me what was then the longest and most lucrative contract in sports history, 25 for 25. Obviously, this deal would be extended upon my playing days as Jerry explained that he wanted me to be in good income and he wanted me to retire as a Laker. He also wanted to guarantee me to have a job after I played and continue to be in the organization with the Los Angeles Lakers. Now, describing the pick fair scene, yes, this actually did happen. Us took both men to Vegas for a weekend for a boys trip. Details are true to Magic's own account. Dr. Buss had arranged this really big brunch, but didn't waste time on any small talk. He looked directly at Norm and began grilling him. Was he still able to play with Magic? Did he think Magic attracted too much press and too much fan attention? Did he need the ball too much, etc.? Because if any of this was a problem to Norm, Buss would be happy to trade him elsewhere. Norm told Buss how much he loved LA, he loved playing with the Lakers, and that he wanted to stay. So overall, I really enjoyed the individual stories, the tension between Pat and Paul, love seeing the backstory of Larry Legend, and finally getting more scenes with Dr. Buss and Magic Johnson. But again, the weakest parts to me seem to be when the show focuses on the Buss family, especially in this episode, the way it was switching between what's going on with Jenny, what's going on with Honey, and then cutting that with like the more heartfelt and kind of more sadder moments with what's going on with Larry. So the flow of this episode felt off but again i like the individual stories i just wish it was paired better within these actual moments but overall i can't deny the great performances and i'm hopeful that the buzz family drama picks up and we have some type of great payoff and hopefully when it comes to this new look lakers they're going to be taking down boston celtics of course getting more of the showtime lakers so let me know what you all thought of this episode your pros your cons your favorite moments your least favorite moments in the comments below as always i appreciate you all watching these breakdowns before we wrap things up if you could consider hitting the like button sharing the breakdown to all your friends that love the show just as much as we do leaving your thoughts in the comments and of course consider subscribing to the channel and hitting that notification bell that way you don't miss out on any of my winning time content you all have been awesome hope you had a good time and i'll catch you all on the next breakdown